kam äh, zu The Lichtenstein National Museum. The Lichtenstein National Museum was founded in the 1890s by somebody who was called Karin, and he was at this period the governor of the Prince of Liechtenstein. And it was situated at this period in the castle of Vaduz. But then in the beginning of the 20th century, the castle was completely restored. In this time, the museum was closed. During the closing period of the castle, the National Museum traveled around in several buildings, and this continued till 1972. In 1972, uh, the museum was opened again in, uh, in a historical building, which is now it is one of the buildings where the National Museum is still uh, to be seen. Between 1992 and 2003, the uh, Liechtenstein National Museum was completely renewed uh, and it was expanded. Uh, so that uh, besides uh, one historical building going back to the 13th century uh, in the Middle Ages, uh, another building which was uh, nearby was combined and this building was uh, also of the 14th century and as a new building and complex there was built a, a building into the mountains. And now the Liechtenstein National Museum is divided into uh, three parts. Two of them, which shows a permanent exhibition, are uh, shown in the two original medieval buildings. And in the new building, which is cast into the mountains, we have uh, normally uh, the nature of Liechtenstein as a permanent show. And we have a lot of rooms for different um, special exhibitions. Nowadays, the Liechtenstein National Museum consists of several other museums too. First, uh, the Liechtenstein National Museum, uh, which has two historical buildings and one new building, showing the permanent exhibition about the history, culture, archaeology, um, landscape, uh, costumes of Liechtenstein. And then uh, we have a new building inside of the mountain, which is divided up into a permanent exhibition about nature of Liechtenstein and the other rooms for, um, for exhibitions of a special theme. Together to this National Museum buildings, we have another building which is called the Building of the Englishmen because it was founded in the 1920s by Englishmen Englishmen who built a very modern building of the 20s here. And inside of this uh, building, we have two museums belonging to the National Museum. It's the Postal Museum and the Treasure Chamber. And then we have another uh, museum, which is the Farmhouse Museum, which is situated not like the other three museums in Vaduz, it is shown in Schellenberg. So in Schellenberg we have another museum, it's a farmhouse museum which is 500 years old. So all together we have uh, five buildings belonging to the National Museum and showing uh, all different kinds of attitudes and uh, information about Liechtenstein. And if you come to Liechtenstein and want to have to a good impression about the country, it's the best to come to the Liechtenstein National Museum. And uh, there you get all the information about the country and then you might feel very comfortable to look around the country in itself. So you are very welcome and hopefully we will see you soon here in our National Museum of Liechtenstein. The Liechtenstein National Museum shows more than 3,000 objects in about 40 galleries. And to give you an impression, we show you now some galleries in the modern part of the building, which is in the mountain. And here you can see the nature of Liechtenstein. And in this room, you see the nature of Liechtenstein in the mountains 
because uh, Liechtenstein is divided up into several parts. Uh, it's in a valley which is very low, only by about 500 meters above the ocean, but then it's going up to th nearly 3,000 meters. And here you have the impression of the mountains from about 1,500 meters to 3,000 meters who are living in this uh, high mountains. The Liechtenstein National Museum uh, shows also a lot of uh, special exhibitions. Uh, normally at the same time four to six exhibitions uh, and of total different uh, uh, information things. For example, we show uh, art, we show uh, archaeology and we show also costumes and we show uh, here, for example, an exhibition about global happiness. So in this exhibition, uh, uh, you can have a lot of questions about happiness, what might be happiness, what is individual happiness, what is happiness of a group, and what is the uh, happiness of a country. And uh, it, uh, you can uh, re enact very much to yourself, and you can uh, put a lot of questions or you will get a lot of questions and so you can think about global happiness and I think that's a very nice thing uh, in our globalized world to come closer together by having uh, ideas about global happiness. In 2015 uh, a new museum was created, the Liechtenstein Treasure Chamber. The Liechtenstein Treasure Chamber has a very big speciality. It's the only treasure chamber in the whole Alps, where you can see really uh, royal uh, art and uh, art handcraft and uh, very special things. We have divided up the, the treasure chamber into several parts. The three parts are following. Uh, first, the principality, then we will come to the world, and at the end we will come to the space and you will understand it when you see the objects. The first part is showing the principality and the treasures of the royal family. Uh, it is beginning with the crown, which is one of the most important crowns which was created uh, 300 years ago in Europe. Then you come to very special things from the princely collection, like historical weapons and uh, very special uh, dishes and uh, sculptures and afterwards we come to the world. The world we will show by a very famous collection of eggs uh, and these eggs are coming really from all around the world. It's, they are coming from, uh, from Europe, from, the, from Northern America, but also from Asia. We have eggs to show also from, uh, from India and China for example. But the most famous ones are the eggs uh, from, the, uh, from Russia, which are about 100 years old and which are mostly done in gold, silver and very precious stones like diamonds, sapphires and rubies. And the most famous one is the apple blossom egg, which we will see later on uh, in detail. At the end, we come to the space, and this might be perhaps the most uh, surprising uh, objects we have in this treasure chamber, because we are the only museum uh, who has in the museum, in one room, two different uh, stones uh, from the moon. And we have it from the mission of uh, Apollo 11 and Apollo 17. So we have really original moonstone coming from the first man who came to the moon from Apollo 11 in 1969. And we have uh, uh, original moonstone from the last man who went to the, uh, to the moon in the Apollo 17 in 1973. And uh, we are very happy to have the privilege to have original moonstone of these two very famous events in discovering the moon. And at the sites we have also something very special. You can see the Rhine River uh, painted by a very famous Swiss painter 200 years ago. And it was the only time where the Rhine River, which is one of the most famous and biggest rivers of Europe, were painted really from the origins coming to the ocean. 
And we have uh, the very famous collection, which was the only one ever done by any artist. And at the end, we see also something which is very famous. Liechtenstein is famous for stamps. And there you can see the first drafts and drawings to design the first stamp of Liechtenstein, which was done in 1912. In 1930, the Postal Museum was opened, and in 2006, it became part of the Liechtenstein National Museum. Uh, in this museum, you can see the whole series of old stamps made in Liechtenstein from the beginning, from 1912 till nowadays. Also, with a lot of Chinese uh, stamps, you can see here and discover from all over the world stamps. Besides this, uh, we have, and that's a really big treasure, we have also the drafts of the famous artists who made the stamps. And that's a tradition which was done already in 1912. In 1912, uh, uh, the first stamp was made by Coloma Mosa, and Coloma Mosa was at this time one of the most famous artists of Austria and he was a friend, for example, of Gustav Klimt. So already the first stamp of uh, Liechtenstein was done by an artist, and the tradition, tradition is still nowadays that all the stamps are made by artists. And we have of all these artists the drafts before they were printed. And so you can also see in our museum the drafts of the famous artists who made the stamps, but also you can see how the stamps were made, and you can see a lot of information about postage, postal systems, how it worked, and uh, we have also special exhibitions, and at that moment, for example, we have a very nice exhibition uh, concerning the space laboratories of the world, so you can see not only the American, Russian, but also the Chinese space labs. The Postal Museum of Liechtenstein is also the first museum in the world who has registered all the stamps of the country. Uh, these are about 4,000 uh, stamps. Uh, and you can, by screen, ask now questions in different languages, in, in German, in English, or in Chinese. And there you can have all information about the stamps. And if you like some special stamps, you can put it on and you can send it even as email to you at uh, home. So that's really something which is very new, uh, very special. And uh, uh, the Stamp Museum also was awarded to be one of the best museums uh, in Europe. And so it's something really very special and all uh, foreigners are welcome to use it also and so see by this uh, what kind of stamps we have. You can ask questions, you can for example ask what are the representations of nature on stamps or you can say I would like to see the portraits of the princess of Liechtenstein or I want to see uh, technical products of Liechtenstein, or you can ask about famous uh, writers and singers of the world, and everything which is on stamp you can find here by questioning it. The Liechtenstein Postal Museum is also famous for his uh, museum shop, which shows a lot of things, and there you can buy all products of stamps uh, from Liechtenstein from the beginning till nowadays, but also the special uh, stamps, for example, we made for China, like here, also for the year of the red, and uh, all the other zodiac signs of, uh, of China, which you can buy here, but also of famous artists like Han Malin, for example, you can see the series here of the, uh, of the 12 uh, signs, zodiac signs made by him. So we have here a, a very big offer. It's also a very big uh, souvenir uh, shop because you can see and buy here a lot of products which were done in Liechtenstein or for Liechtenstein. The farmhouse was constructed in 1518. It uses the block method of stacking logs on top of each other uh, to form the walls. A technique typical of farmhouses built in the region after 1500. 
Above a brick cellar stood a two-story living space comprising a kitchen which was situated in the middle of the house to heat all the other rooms. According to medieval feudal law, the houses was movable property belonging to the tenant and uh, it was rent the territory for 99 years. For this reason, the wooden beams were numbered. The Biedermann house was moved several times, including in 1687, 1793 and 1991. During the relocation in 1793, the flat saddle roof was exchanged for a steeper gabled roof. The building was last moved in 1991 to 1993 in order to prevent it from being demolished and it became a part of our museum in 1993. Some of the very latest concepts for low energy buildings and sustainable constructions were already being applied here some 500 years ago. The house consists of a timber frame insulated with moss and lichen. Even packs and nails were made of wood. Iron was avoided. The configuration, the low ceilings and the few windows in the room reduced the amount of energy required for heat. As glass was very expensive in this period, most of the uh, windows were in wood. The beams were even numbered when the building was relocated over 300 years ago, enabling the structure to, to move from one side to another. The Biedermann House is also an example of typical settlement construction and working habits in the Principality of Liechtenstein in the late Middle Ages. The house provides a very interesting insight of how people lived in Liechtenstein 100 years ago. And you are welcome to see it and uh, to appreciate how people lived here 100 years ago. And you will learn a lot of things about also the costume and habits used at this period here. The house is accompanied by a marvelous garden. And in this garden you can see a traditional garden system. In the middle you see vegetables and healing plants and uh, the whole is surrounded by flowers. One of the most famous uh, uh, objects we have in our museum is a very famous egg by Fabergé. Uh, Fabergé was a uh, goldsmith of, the, of Russia. He first went to Germany to learn to be a goldsmith and went then to St. Petersburg where he opened a whole, an own workshop and uh, began to make very precious eggs. Most of them are in gold, combined with very famous also stones, uh, brilliants, diamonds, sapphires, rubies, and uh, he became in this way the imperial goldsmith for the last two Tsars, Alexander III and Nicholas II. And he created between 1885 and 1916 about 50 luxurious eggs for the family of the Tsar. Uh, it was always the Tsar who gave it, uh, ordered it, and he combined it always. One was for his mother and one was for his wife. And, uh, and so each year two were produced, one for the mother and one for the wife of the Tsar. Afterwards, uh, beginning of the 20th century, there was uh, um, a man who was called Kelch, and Kelch, Kelch was considered to be even more rich than the Tsar. And he wanted to have an egg which is more expensive than the two eggs come ordered by the Tsar at the same year. And in 1901, uh, the Tsar uh, had uh, ordered the two most expensive eggs for his wife and his mother and at the same time Kelch produced an egg uh, which was even more expensive than both together. So the egg you can see here is the most expensive egg ever done by Karl Fabergé. 
Another very special thing of this uh, egg is the representation, what it's meaning. Uh, it, uh, like all the famous eggs of Russia, uh, it has an own name. It is called the apple blossom egg. And that's something which is very strange for Russia. It is the only egg who shows the blossom, uh, the apple blossom uh, as an egg. And that's very special because that's really a theme which is typical for the Far East, for China and Japan. And uh, we can see it here in a very uh, nice way. Uh, there are four trees with apple blossom. They are made in gold. And uh, at the end, you see the blossoms. And the blossoms are made in gold and filled by white enable. And in the middle, you see rose diamonds. And the whole is uh, surrounded by a green egg. And this green egg is in shade. It took one year to make this egg by one stone cutter who needed so much time because he had to hollow the whole egg. And you have to imagine if you open the, when you open the egg, it's only two millimeters of thickness. So it's really something very, very special. And it was done by Michael Perkin. Michael Perkin was the most famous um, employee by Karl Fabergé. So that's really some, the top of the top. And it's very nice to show the apple blossom uh, trees, uh, which is really also a reference to the Far East in 1901. Here we can see now the most famous archaeological find of Liechtenstein. It was discovered in 1930 in a little village near the capital Vaduz. The village is called uh, Balzers and the special place where it was found is called Gutenberg. And after this, this group is named the Gutenberg Group. The Gutenberg Group consists of several bronze statues showing uh, different goddess and uh, animals. The, the oldest one was uh, uh, made in 500 BC and was probably the main god who was represented in a sanctuary. Uh, and this sanctuary was at this period devoted to the god of war uh, and after this it was called the Mars Statute but it belonged to the Celts. The Celts have been peoples who first lived especially in France and southern Germany and Austria. And during the centuries, they became more and more strong and invaded other parts of Europe. And finally, in the fourth and third century, they, for example, conquered also Rome and Italy. They went to Greece and destroyed Delphi. And afterwards, even some parts went to, into Asia and came to near Anatolia, to Turkey. And uh, it was a very big empire. They worshipped especially um, the nature. And the priests uh, were very linked with the nature. And uh, uh, the most important god was for them first a warrior god. And this statue, the biggest one, which was done in 500 BC, uh, was devoted probably to this warrior god. This warrior god became, in, during the centuries, more uh, special powers. And he became not only a warrior god, but also a god of fertility. First it was combined, so some of the figures show him as a warrior and at the same time as a god of fertility. Uh, and uh, during the 3rd and 2nd century BC, he was mostly a fertility god. And this you see on the representations. Besides them, um, uh, we, you found, we found in this group, which was uh, put into a temple, two animals, which are typical animals uh, for the Celts, it was uh, one is showing a boar and the other one is showing a stake. And both are symbols of uh, fertility and also of mighty powers. And because uh, 
both of them have either teeth or core antlers which are very uh, very pointed and uh, with this point they killed the bad things and therefore they were venerated also by the by the cells in a special way. And this group is the only group ever found in the whole Celtic uh, regions from, uh, from France going till, uh, till Anatolia and Turkey, where we found a sanctuary with the original uh, gods shown as statues. So that's really something very special uh, also for whole Europe and Western Asia. And uh, we are very proud to have these famous statues. And these are really of, of one of the most famous uh, also um, people of ancient times in Europe, the Celts. Now we are in the Gothic room. It's a historical room which was done about 1500. And this was uh, in this uh, medieval building. It was a kind of hotel and it was at the same time also a station for taxis and uh, in this room was a dining room for people who came here and were sleeping in the hotel and, uh, and then they could also eat here. And in this historical special room we have uh, treasures uh, which were found in Liechtenstein and in Liechtenstein we found regularly a lot of coin treasures. And that's because Liechtenstein was a very important part of the uh, extension of the Silk Road. You have to imagine uh, since the medieval, uh, since already a very long time ago, the Silk Road was established from China to Venice in Italy. And when uh, Silk, for example, came f uh, to Venice, it was Taiwan, it was put forward also to other regions in Europe and uh, from Venice it came over Milan and Italy, it came to Switzerland and to Liechtenstein and this main road from Liechtenstein went over to Middle and Northern Europe. And therefore also Liechtenstein is a part of the Silk Road in ancient times and we can prove it also by all this coin hoard finds. Uh, because uh, on this coin, for example, like this one, which is a treasure which was buried in about 1360 or 1365, we found uh, a lot of different coins. And these coins, like the gold coins, are coming from Italy, and the silver coins are coming from uh, Switzerland, from northern Germany, and from Austria and Hungary. So you see, uh, this was one of the main uh, roads linking uh, the Mediterranean part and Italy to the northern part of Europe, to northern Germany and Scandinavia. And uh, it crossed via the Silk Road also Liechtenstein. And therefore, this is a very important document to show that a lot of people also used this uh, use this road and this building here especially was built for this reason because here it was a kind of hotel where you can release uh, during your trip from North Europe to, to Italy or the country from Italy to North Europe and uh, a lot of people were sleeping here, also very famous people, like for us very important, a very famous German writer, Goethe, when he went to Italy, he crossed this part and he was sleeping also in this historical building, which is now, now it is part of the Liechtenstein National Museum. So we are very proud to be a part and an extension of the Silk Road and that Liechtenstein always have been a linking country, linking uh, Northern Europe with Southern Europe. This Lenten wheel is from the parish church of Bendern, a little village uh, close to the capital of Liechtenstein, Vaduz. It's about 10 kilometers far away. Um, the wheel is said to have been donated by two women from the neighboring Swiss parish of Hart. It shows 24 scenes from the Old and New Testament and the legend at the bottom tell us when it was made. 
It was made in 1612 and uh, there's also the initials and these initials EGC uh, meaning the painter Johann Georg Lesi who lived in Feldkirch in Austrian city very close to Vaduz, only about 20 kilometers far away at the time. Lenten wheels of this size were hung at the chancel in the church during Lent as according to Catholic tradition. All crucifixes had to be shrouded in this week, weeks before Easter. Only on Easter Wednesday were they revealed again to the faithful when the part of St. Luke's Gospel is read where it says, then the wheel of the temple was torn down the middle. Lenten wheels such as that in Bendern were also drawn to the site of at requiem masses during Lent and during readings from the Bible. The wheel has a height of 4, 4 meters 70 centimeters and a broad of 6 meters 30. Ten vertical lines of the wheel was put together. The 24 scenes are uh, 90 centimeters of height. The textile was painted with the illustrations. Below each scene, the theme of representations is written down and the illusion of the Bible is cited. But why is this uh, wheel is so important? Because nowadays we have only still five preserved in the world. Uh, 500 years ago, it was common to have it in nearly all churches in Middle and Southern Europe, but all of them vanished except five which are still existing, and four of them are normally not displayed there in churches and not seen. And that's really the only big Lenten wheel which is open to the public. So what you see here is really something unique in the world. In the first row, we see scenes of the Old Testament. Uh, perhaps uh, the beginning is also one of the most important uh, legends of the Old Testament. It's showing the creation of uh, the world, uh, combined with the creation of Eva, the wife of Adam. You see Adam lying naked uh, on the earth and out of his body is coming uh, his wife Eva and on the right upper part you see Eva and Adam close to a tree and at this tree is there was uh, apples and it was forbidden uh, to them to eat them but Eva was convinced by a serpent which was um, the devil to eat an apple and because she did something which was forbidden, they had to leave the paradise. Several generations later on, uh, a lot of people lived all over the world but became more and more bad and then God decided to destroy all of them except one couple who uh, worshipped God very much and this was Noah. And Noah was uh, called to build up uh, a ship and invited all different kind of animals to come into the ship and to survive the heavy raining. And the heavy raining uh, made an ocean of the whole world and only the, one, the people who lived in the Ark of Noah survived. These are two of the main first uh, legends of the Old Testament. And the second to the fourth row, you see the story about Jesus Christ. And on the second floor, on the left side, the first one is the Annunciation. You see an angel to the left who is telling Maria, um, which is staying beside a bed, that soon she will get a child which is the child of God, Jesus Christ. And on the next panel to, uh, to it, you see uh, the birth of Jesus Christ, and you see the young uh, baby as, uh, in a, on a little bed, 
and surrounded by two angels who are worshipping here and also his mother Maria worshipping him and in the background you see his father Saint Joseph uh, looking at it and on the background you see three shepherds and the three shepherds were admiring the birth of Jesus Christ. At the end of the second drawer, to the right, you see a famous uh, subject of the New Testament, it's the Last Supper. You see in the middle, uh, Jesus Christ sitting around and around him, the 12 apostles who are, who are looking at him and having together the Last Supper before, the day before he was kept and uh, killed. At the third row, to the right, uh, you see uh, Jesus Christ carrying, carrying the cross and he was helped in one little period also by a man. And in front of him you see uh, a woman who has in his hands a wheel and on this wheel you see the, the representation of the head of Jesus Christ, which became afterwards a very famous um, sign of God and which is worshipped for especially in Italy. In the middle of the last row, you see uh, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is above his own tomb and uh, it is said after three days of death, he resurrected and you see uh, uh, beside him four soldiers, four soldiers who had to protect the tomb by worshippers. And the last scene of the whole uh, story, you can see here, uh, it's uh, the last judgment. Uh, uh, it is in the church belief that after, after a certain period, there will be a last judgment about all people, about how they lived and what will happen to them. And there you see in the scene in the middle, you see uh, God on, on a, sitting on a kind of throne, which is the world. And beside him you see on the left Maria, and below you see uh, an angel who is showing the way to the paradise for the people who have been good. And on the right lower part, you see uh, the people who were very bad in her life and are condemned to go to the hell. And the hell is shown as being like a fire with uh, dragons, demons who were eating them. And you see two devils who are leading the bad men into the hell. Here we see a very important uh, painting which was in a church or in a chapel of a castle and uh, which is very important for the development of landscape paintings in Europe. But before we are coming to the theme of this uh, altar, we can see also the origin of this uh, painting. Uh, it's a typical painting of the Alps, but we don't know actually where it is coming from. That's still a mystery. But we know that it was uh, in an auction in, in the 1950s and at this period it belonged to a princess of Liechtenstein and it was bought by a Jewish woman and she gave it only uh, nine years ago to the museum as a gift with the content that she said she wants to give this very important painting to the National Museum of Liechtenstein because once in the 30s the Liechtenstein, uh, Liechtenstein rescued her life. In this period, in the 1930s and 1940s, um, the Nazis were ruling over Germany and uh, a lot of uh, Jewish people and political people tried to escape from Germany and we are uh, Liechtenstein, a lot of this very intellectual and religious people were rescued. And thanks to this, we have, for example, uh, this altar, but we have also a lot of other uh, gifts from people who were rescued by Liechtenstein in this very difficult period of the 1930s and beginning of the 1940s. Here, the special thing is first, uh, the subject in itself is very typical for the period of 
about 1500. You see in the middle, in the main part, you see um, Maria with the uh, child Jesus Christ and be behind her you can see his, her husband uh, Saint Joseph and on the other side uh, you see the parents of Maria it's uh, the Saint Anna and Saint Joachim and both of them, uh, all of them are looking to the center where you see the young child uh, and this child is Jesus Christ uh, that's still a normal representation of the period and also what is normal that you have in a bigger and bigger altars and this bigger altar shows that it was either uh, originally in a very big church or in a very big chapel of a castle uh, and there you see other figures of saints to the left on the left wing you see uh, the holy martin Holy Martin was a Roman soldier who lived in the 4th century AD and there uh, is a legend about him that once when he was a, a Roman soldier he came to a, to a city and in the city there was a very poor man and it was very cold, it was winter times and he was nearly naked and he, he, it was very frozen and he, was, uh, and he asked to be helped by somebody. He, Saint Martin came, saw him, and he had a very good mantle, and he divided the mantle into two parts and gave one to him so that he could recover his body and has no longer cold. The next one uh, is uh, Saint uh, Sebastian. He was killed uh, because he was believing in the in the Christian religion at a period where the soldiers in general have been uh, pagans and uh, the emperor, the Roman emperor decided to kill him but firstly it did succeed to, to kill him and then the soldiers killed him by arrows. Uh, on the right wing you see a mythical figure, it's Saint Christophorus and on his shoulders He's carrying Jesus Christ and uh, in this legend it was called that Jesus Christ wanted to cross a river and, uh, at the, and there normally Christopher is helped to carry people over the river and he was very strong but uh, when uh, Jesus Christ asked him if he can cross him over the river he said no problem you are only a child and then when he came to the middle of the, of the river, uh, Jesus Christ became more and more heavy. And at the end, he could uh, just succeed to go to the other side of the river, but then realized that somebody he carried was like a God. And that's the representation here. And on the right one, we see another saint, which is um, uh, with who, who was a bishop, but we don't know exactly the name of the saint. Probably it's uh, uh, a bishop called uh, Louis, uh, uh, but we are not sure. But what is the most important in this painting is really we see here a change man. Normally, uh, these figures in medieval times, uh, the background was only in gold or only in one color. And you see on the left and right wing, still uh, the upper part is in gold, but below it, it's beginning to show landscape. And in the middle part of the altar, you see completely landscape. And that's the first and the oldest uh, painting of the Alps, where we can discover the changement from olden, only golden background to landscape. And therefore it's so important for art history because this is the first uh, painting which is beginning to show also landscape, which will become in the next centuries one of the most uh, typical scenes to introduce also to art painting landscapes. But here it's really the beginning uh, in the Alps and that's something therefore very important for the art development in the art of the Alps. 
Finally, we are ending this visit of our National Museum of Liechtenstein in this uh, historical room, which is 500 years old and was belonging to a house in Liechtenstein. And I wanted to thank you all to follow our, our visit through the museums we have of the Liechtenstein National Museum. Thank you.